Once again, saints, we thank you for joining us. We are live here at Brian Missionary Baptist Church, located in the capital city of Montgomery, Alabama. If you have time, if the spirit moves so on you, you are more than welcome. We thank you for joining us through all of our social media platforms. Today we'll be studying God's word from James 3. That's James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, dealing with the tongue. Amen. And we're going to look at it through a spiritual perspective. Now, you may say, why are we looking at this through a spiritual perspective? Well, I've shared with you on many times before that we are composed of a body, a soul, and a spirit. And the tongue is more than just something that we use to sense and taste food with. The word of God said, blessings and curses come from the tongue. The word of God states that life and death is in the power of the tongue. The word of God also states that the tongue is an unruly thing and that no man, no woman can tame it. So if that's true, how do we deal with taming the tongue? Well, I'm glad you asked the question. Because the word also states that there is no way given unto man whereby men may be saved but by, but, but through Christ Jesus. So he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the answer to our problems. So if you're dealing with an issue, then he is the doorway. He's the key. So when we look at this right here, uh, we just want to encourage you to look at it from your perspective. Then we want you to activate your prayer, you know, and just have a private conversation with God about where you are in this. Because I declare to you that God will reveal to you where you are, where you need to be, and how you can get there. If you wish to support this ministry, you may do so through the Give and Fly app. That's giveandfly.com. Or you can do it. Uh, uh, by downloading the app or simply contacting the church, we'll be glad to receive your contribution so that this ministry may continue to thrive and go forward. Let's look at the scripture this morning. We keep and uplift our sick, shut in, and bereaved family. In James, he begins by saying, My brothers, be not men and masters, knowing that we shall received a greater condemnation. Now, if you look at the NIV translation of this, it says not many of you should become teachers, uh, my brothers, my fellow brothers, because know that uh, we who teach are be to be judged more strictly. So he's talking about people in leadership positions of the church, teachers, ministers, pastors, okay? So I know a lot of people when they look at being in the church, they look at any organization, they look at the fame and the glory of it. They look at, well, this person is in charge, you know, they get all the glitz and the glamour. You may look at some ministry that's very successful, but then what you have to understand is that God is holding us to a standard. You have to understand that we have to set the example for which others to follow, and that doesn't stop us from being human. We still have issues that we have to deal with, too. So, but it just kind of gives you a word of caution uh, that uh, how we're supposed to carry and conduct ourselves. I want you to look at verse number two in this scripture. Verse number two says, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and also, and able also to bridle the whole body. Okay? Now, if you look at the NIV version, it said, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who's never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to be, keep their whole body in check. So all of us have messed up along the way. Matter of fact, you don't have to go back 10, 15, or 20 years. Just yesterday, you said something or did something that offended somebody. Just this morning, either by commission, something that you did, or omission, something that you failed to do, you
cause somebody to be hurt. Now let me tell you what a believer is obligated to do. Once you feel like you've offended somebody, once that person comes to you and say, hey, you upset me, you hurt my feelings, you obligated by God to apologize, to say that I'm sorry. And then when they apologize to you, you obligated to forgive them because the forgiveness is not for them, it's for you. The word of God says that if you don't forgive your brothers and sisters, their sins and trespasses, neither will he forgive you. So when somebody say you sorry, what that is, is that's just like taking the eraser and erasing the book, removing all tracks and traces of the chalk that was there before. And that's what we have to learn to do. We say stuff like, I forgive, but I don't forget. That's not how God forgives us. And neither is that the way that we should forgive each other. Now, if you still run around and you pouting and you mad and you upset and you let what happened yesterday deal with or what's going on today, you miss the boat. Because once you forgive somebody, it's supposed to be a brand new slate. You're supposed to be able to pick it up where you left out. That's why you have to put your arm on. That's why you have to watch. I said before and I said again, anytime the devil can use you, abuse you, he glad to do. And as you get mature, you have to know what the tricks of the devil is. Now Friday I had a situation to occur at work. Lady came, you know, said some words to me, you know, she said, well, hey, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. I'll do better. There's no problem. Once she, once she said that, that wiped the slate clean. Why? Because I'm not equipped to handle that. I don't have room in my mind, my body, my spirit to deal with that issue. That'll make me angry and bitter towards somebody else. That'll steal my joy. So be careful what you hide in the repository of your body. Some stuff you just need to let go. If God could be the answer to your problem, then let him be the answer to the problem. Quit trying to fix stuff you're not equipped to fix. Quit walking around here making yourself look ugly. I told my supervisor some weeks ago, I said, I got a birthday coming up in September, and I still plan to be looking good and talking good. And I'm not going around here getting upset about nothing, stuff that ain't got nothing to do with me, you know because we're all adults in here. Let's look at this scripture now. It said there are some things. Now, understand this. Sometimes we say things that offend people that we don't intend to do. Maybe they come out wrong. Maybe they misunderstand, you know. But, but, but this lesson is telling us that we got to be mindful that of how we present things to people. Now, that's true for everybody. The other thing we got to be mindful of is I've been watching and it's dawned on me that there are some people that have never apologized for nothing. They see the fault in you, but they ain't never said they sorry about nothing. Well, let's see what's wrong with that. Well, the word of God said there's none perfect. It says there's none righteous, no, not one. So. If Jesus can apologize for what he didn't do so that we can have access to him, we can have a greater life, we can have more peace, more joy, more abundance, how come you can't say you sorry for stepping on somebody's foot, for cutting somebody off in traffic? And here we are in the middle of a national pandemic. We, we dealing with some stuff we're dealing with a modern day plague that we hadn't seen in this country in a number of years. And on yesterday, we, you know, I was traveling along the bypass and heard somebody just screaming and yelling, what the world is that going on? We're in the middle of traffic. A couple lanes over, there was somebody driving. Apparently they were talking to somebody on the telephone or in the car with them, and you could hear them all over the bypass simply because they had the window rolled down and their voice was carrying like that. And they were just going off, going off, going off. 
And I know some things people say that will upset you and get your feathers riled up. Hey, we human. We all got issues like that. But when we go get to the resolution, when we go learn to solve stuff without pushing people aside, when we go learn to solve stuff without violence, we're talking about going in our pocket or going in our trunk. We got to be mindful that we own this earth for a purpose. The pastor just shared that some people lost their life through this corona thing. Could it be what you harboring on the inside of you, the hate, the malice, the anger, is rushing you towards your death? Maybe you need to get in a hurry and say I'm sorry. Maybe you need to get in a hurry and ask God to show you where you messed up at so that he can start and finish the work that he, he began on you. There's nothing wrong with that. But we holding on to too much stuff and it's hindering our blessings. It's hindering our peace, our joy. That's why we go to the doctor and the doctor said, well, I don't see nothing wrong with you, but your blood pressure high. I'm giving you medication for it, you know, but, but it ain't working. So we got to be mindful that this stuff you're holding on to, even though it's spiritual in nature, can in fact infect your body. It goes on here to say here in the, in the, in the second, so we stumble in many ways, many ways. And sometimes we've been doing stuff so long, we don't even know what our faults are. And we, we justify people by saying that's just the way they are. No, it's not. Most of the things we do is a learned behavior. What we have not learned to do is we have not earned learned the behavior. We hadn't came to the point that we said, well, wait a minute. I've been doing it like this for 20 years, but maybe I need to change. I got some bad habits. I look at myself sometimes and say, oh, you know you can do better. You ain't got to do it like that. But until you come to the conclusion that not everything you say and do is right, you still go miss the mark. And that's what makes athletes great. They know what areas to train to condition themselves for optimal performance. That's what you want. You want optimal performance in your spiritual life. You ain't just came to church so that you can get your ears tickled by the minister, by the teacher. No, you came to church so you can hear the word and know how to apply it to your life. You came to church so you can make a conclusion and say, you know what, I ain't been doing it like this, but I'm going to start trying. I'm going to take a step and let God help me with this thing so I can be more like him every day. When we go down to the fourth verse, it talks about ships, for example. It said they are large and are driven uh, uh, by strong winds, but they are still by a very small rudder. Now, those of you listening with me on social media, I want you to say rudder, okay? And then it talks about the tongue. And it said the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boats. Consider how a great forest is set on fire by a small spark, okay? And then they want us to look at these two things. Now, the first example talks about a ship. And it says, no matter how big the ship is, whether it's a surface ship or a subsurface ship, there is something that controls the ship called the rudder. It's normally at the back of the boat or the ship. And by adjusting the rudder, you can dictate which direction in the water the ship will go. Then it talks about the forest fire and how you can get a blazing forest fire from just one spot. I can remember being a little boy going down the highway we were coming from the home church. Somebody flicked their cigarette butt out and it lit up. And we called, and, 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 and they dispatched firefighters. And, and not only is the fire in that area, but it's in other areas too because it's spread. Now watch where I'm going with this. If you recall in the scripture, when Moses was born, it said that his mother fashioned him an ark. You know the scripture. Placed it in the river Jordan and floated down there. And that's how Pharaoh's daughter got Moses out there. 
Notice she didn't call it a boat. She called it an ark. When God got ready to destroy the world, he told Noah to build an ark. Now I'm going to ask you this question. Why didn't God call it a boat? Why didn't he call it a ship? Why didn't he say that this is something here that, 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 that can be controlled by the sail, by, can, can be controlled by oars? He doesn't mention none of that. It ain't even in the design. The reason God do not call it a boat or a ship, because boat and ships have rudders that control it. But when he called it an ark, he called it because he's the one that's controlling it. And he don't need you trying to control the situation that he done put you in. When Moses got in that ark, he controlled the current. He controlled the way it went. He controlled who saw it. That's what an ark is. Okay? Then it goes on to say when, 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 when Noah preached to the people for over 100 years, he didn't need no rubber. Matter of fact, when God told Noah to get into the ark, he closed the door and it took off. So we need God to control us. We don't need to be the brother. We don't need our two cents in. Some of the greatest arguments that have happened in the Congress, in politics, in the church, in your large meeting, in school, and at work, have been sparked because people let stuff come out their mouth that they should let come out. And nine times out of ten, the folks that are doing the most talking, the ones that are doing the most vocal stuff, don't have a clue of what's going on. They caught up in their feelings, in their emotions, and they have a disregard for policy and procedure. Now, if you think that this is not true, you go back and look at some of the stuff that has happened in the world. Look at the debates, you know. Look at politicians talk. Look at conversations that we have on our job, the meetings that we have, okay? Look at how we go about doing things. There are a lot of things we could get accomplished if we could learn the reason and rationalize. Everybody can't be right. Somebody got to be wrong. Now the word says study to show yourself approved. So, before you open your mouth and start talking, ask yourself this question, do I really know what I'm talking about? And it amazes me that when they get to talk about a serious issue, they always get the wrong people on TV. I don't want to call no names. I could very well do that. But there are some people that's on TV right now because of their celebrity status. Folks ask them what they think about it. And they give the most ridiculous, the most absurd, and has nothing to do with factual information. Look at the people that have access to the president. I think you're a witness to this here. Some of these people, they citizens like you and I, but they not qualified to speak on the stuff that they're doing. And if he listen to that, it's going to cause some people some harm. My point is this. Is what you saying, because of your position, causing people harm? Are you hurting people by saying stuff you don't really need to be saying? So you got to think about it. When God puts you in position, you need to be at a point where you can talk, where you can represent. You can bring some factual information. Now we go on to look at this tune. A lot of marriages have problems because husbands say things to wives. Wives say things to husband that get the balance of the relationship all out of order. And when they say it, they say it with the intention of hurting somebody. They pick on a sensitive area. They say something that's going to hurt somebody's feelings, make them cry. You owe God and that person an apology for doing that. I don't care how many years ago it happened. And then people go around and boast about it. I ain't forgot what you said 20 years ago. Maybe if you get rid of that junk that you've been holding on to, you can have some peace. Maybe you can sleep at night. Maybe your blood pressure will go down. 
Maybe your stress level will go down. Maybe these unexplained illnesses that you shouldn't be dealing with will cease from being in your body if you learn how to forgive. Not only do you have to forgive the person, you got to forgive yourself. You've done some things, said some things. Yeah, you know that it was wrong to do, but you can't hold on to it. This is another trick of the enemy. The enemy will tell you, you ain't no good, you ain't got no business doing this. How you go do this when you just did this, said that? I remember when you said this, this that is a trick of the enemy. And you need to know that God said that he's married to the backslide. God said that he would forgive you and throw it into the sea of forgiveness. So let's go and see what James says. <clears throat> It says, likewise, the tongue, small part of the body, okay? Then it says the tongue is also like a fire. And it says a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. This one little thing is slippery in nature. And some people say, that, oops, I slipped and said it. But see, that ain't entirely true either. Let me expose it to you. First of all, you thought about it before you said it. And then when the opportunity presented itself, when your emotions got riled up and up, instead of you having self-control, you said it, and you said it made you feel good to say it. But what you don't know is that caused somebody harm. It caused you harm. Because your tongue is supposed to speak life or death. That's the word of God. Now, what do you mean life or death? For example, my mother told me, son, you're going to be all right. I know you're going to be all right. Uh, you listen to what I said, and you go, you're going to have great blessings in your life. I said, yes, ma'am. That is a blessing. That's her conferring a blessing on me. There are some parents, you heard them. We make fun of it on TV. You ain't cold be nothing. Your daddy wasn't nothing. And now you ain't cold be nothing. If that boy or girl believe that, and no one never reverses it, they never get to the point in their life to what somebody tell them you fearfully and wonderfully made you exceptionally. God created you to do great things. He created you to be a business owner. He created you to be a giver. Then that stigma is attached to them based on what somebody spoke. And it doesn't matter who spoke it. The best example I got for you, when I went in the military, the first couple of weeks that you there, you can't do nothing right. No matter how right you are, in their eyes is wrong. And every little mistake you make, they tear you down. I mean, they go at you hard. You doing push-up, mule kicks, flutter kicks, ball busters, whatever they, they can think of to do. And you think like, man, I wish these folks leave me alone. But somewhere around the fourth or the fifth week, they began to build you up. They began to say, hey, that, that, that right there, that's a sharp soldier there. Look at him, look at how he do that thing. Go ahead and do it. Now you start to feel good about yourself. My point is this, you can't tear people down and never build them up. Everything can't be so horrific that everything they say and do is wrong and you never give them a compliment. That's what the word means when it said life and death. You've got to speak life to a person. Have you ever thought you might encounter somebody that's suicidal? And the word that you say to them may make the difference between whether they choose to go to the left or to the right. Another thing that you got to do is you got to let people care for you. Now, they may not be multi-millionaires. They may not have it all together. But anytime somebody is willing to share with you from their heart, that's a God-sent gift. 
And the least you can do is be appreciative. Some of us block our blessings by being unappreciative of what other people try to do. Now, I know my mom did a lot of sacrificing for me. A lot of sacrificing. She could have bought stuff for herself, but she wanted me to have it. She wanted me to know what it was like. And so, right across the street used to be a restaurant called Duff Smorgasbord. It was one of the, the first buffet-style restaurants in Montgomery. And I showed up there with a suit on, and a good friend of mine was there. And we met up in the bathroom. It's the sun. We both had suits on. And we were posing in the mirror. And we were proud. And, and we were all excited that we were dressed. Now, we didn't pay a dime for these suits. But at the time, my mom was making, working on a minimum wage job. And I remember very specifically that she was making somewhere between $3.35 and $5.80 an hour, plus she had all the bills. Single parent, single parent household, but she wanted me to have a double-breasted suit. She wanted me to know what it felt like, what it looked like for me to have a suit. And I was glad she gave it to me, you know. I was happy about it. But I didn't understand the sacrifice I don't know whether she paid for it all at once or she put money aside. But what I'm saying was when she gave it to me, everything was, yes, ma'am, I thank you, I appreciate it, you know. And I never forgot that. Sometimes it's too easy for us to forget the sacrifices that people make. Your sacrifice may not be somebody else's sacrifice. The things that we take for granted, when we ride along the highway, you see them stripes in the road. Somebody had to get out there when it was hot, when it was cold, and put them stripes out there. Somebody had to stand alongside the road and hope they didn't get ran over while they worked on the side. You walk up and down the highway and you see sidewalks. Somebody had to pour that concrete. You see the, the sanitation workers out there. You know, in the middle of coronavirus, they still got to pick up trash. Have you, you ever thought, you know, what they're picking up? they putting themselves in jeopardy just so that we can have a better quality of life. So sometimes you got to watch what we say because you don't pay the price that some other people pay. Quit being so mean, so ugly, so vindictive, and act like you got the spirit of God within you. It said here that all kinds of animals, this is verse number seven, all kinds of animals. It lists birds, reptiles, sea serpents, and of things in the sea is tame and, 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 and have been tamed by mankind. So in other words, man can take any animal, put it in captivity, we can go to the zoo and check it out. We can look at it. But the tongue, no man can tame it. It is unruly, evil, full of deadly poison. Now this is scripture. And it ain't just talking about somebody in the United States. It's talking about everybody that's a human being that's in the United States. Your tomb, my tomb, it said right here, is unruly. Is evil and full of deadly poison. Now, how do we get that? We get it by surroundings. You may not cuss, but you're around folks that cuss. And sometimes being around folks is enough. Now you got the thought in your mind, and the thought becomes an action. So you start doing it. And sometimes you, it's so out of character for you. Somebody tell you that ain't even you. You don't even need to be saying that. You know you don't do nothing like that. So if our tongue is unruly, if it's evil and full of deadly poison, we don't have to stay that way. We can go to God and let God begin to work on us. We can confess this scripture right here. We can go to God and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I confess my tongue, according to your scripture, is unruly. I confess that it's full of poison and that it's evil. 
I need you to help me. Help regulate my tongue. Not only help regulate my tongue, help me to be effective in my communication so that I speak blessings and not curses. I speak life and not death. I speak encouragement and not discouragement. Help me, Jesus, under the covering and the power of your blood. If you say that and do that, then you give God permission to do it because he's not forcing himself on you. It has to be your choice. Got to be what you want to do. Don't let nobody fool you. If you ask anything from God, being a believer, it has to be your choice. And if you ask him, he's faithful and just to give it to you. Okay? So the tongue, we praise the Lord and the Father, and, 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 and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Do you know you made in God's likeness? Huh? Do you know you look like what right you got to say that somebody is ugly? Huh? And just in case you don't know what the likeness of God is, it tells you in Genesis that God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now we ain't talking about your body frame. We ain't talking about whether you petite or were you robust or voluptuous? That ain't the likeness of God. We're talking about the spirit that's in you is the likeness of God. So you can't talk about me without talking about God. Great God Almighty. I look like it. I talk like it. My plans are like him. And even though I'm not a perfect person, each day I get better and better. That's how we are. You know, so you got to watch how you put your mouth on people because you don't know how God is moving, how he's molding and shaping them. Yeah, they got some faults. You got some faults. You ain't all that. You just as dust as the next person. That's why when you take a bath, that rain be round the tub because you dust. You dirty. You need not only to be cleaned up with zest, tone, dial, and any other kind of stuff. You need to be spiritually clean. You need the word of God. You need the blood that cleanses, that washes, that restores, that renews. You need to come to church. This ain't the time to miss out on church. Folks, check it out of this world. And you need to make sure you clean before you show up there. Because you can't show up there without your ticket talking about oops. Either you're in or you're out. And the word says, if your name ain't written in the Lamb's book of life, he's going to tell you to depart. Now that's what the word says. I ain't got nothing to do with that. Now, watch what this says here. It says out of the same mouth, Come praise and curse. Now, it's, it, it, it's funny, ministers would get a kick out of this. But the thing that got Satan kicked out of heaven was that he was in the choir. Now, y'all watch this now. He was the chief praise leader, he could hit all the notes, he had access to the throne of God. He knew what moved God. He was intimate with him, close with him, but he got the big head. He decided that he wanted to exhort himself above God, as if God don't know that now. Anytime someone said they all knowing, that means they know what you're thinking about before you think, before you can form the thought, they already know about it. So he going to try to kick God out of his own house. That's what got him kicked out. Now, not only did he get kicked out, but he was able to influence a third of heaven, a third of people that had an eternal destiny. And he got them messed up too. Well, you might say, well, brother, what that got to do with you? Well, there are always some people that try to influence you in the wrong direction for their satisfaction, for their good, as if God don't know that. See, 
And that's why you got to watch the wiles and the tricks of the enemy. Now, here's the funny part. There's still people singing in the choir today that want to tell the musician what to play. Want to tell the musician how they go sing the song. Can't follow nobody, but they praise God. That's what the scriptures say. That, that, that you can't praise and that you can't bless and curse at the same time. The old folks used to say you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. And some, some, some folks will remember that. So you got you to gotta do what the rapper Ice Cube said. You got to check yourself. Whose side are you really on? See, you can't come into the organization and dictate to the organization what you go do. You come there to follow rules and regulations. You come there to do what they instruct you to do. Some of us got this thing wrong. Now, I know a lot of times that we don't always get the best treatment. They could do things a little better. But if you come now just being rebellious, you just come there and make up that, well, it's Monday morning and I don't feel like working and I ain't going to do nothing, that's witchcraft. Now watch this. Let me show you this other trick. Let's say you are part of an organization, any organization. And somebody comes to you and they say, well, can, can I depend on you to do this? And you say, yeah, I got you. I'm going to be with you through thick and thin. Uh, I'm down with you like four flat tires. And then when they look for you, you ain't there. When they ask you, say, well, hey, brother, hey, sister, where you was? You say that you will be there. And then you get the back and up. That's what we call passive witchcraft. That is just as destructive as you saying that you ain't going to do it or you being unsupported. Because now you add more burden, more responsibilities to people than what they already got. They can't fully focus on their job because they got to do the extra stuff. And then what get me is most believers, most believers become bi bilingual at, at this time here. Because, you know, after everything is said and done, they're going to tell you, look what we done. Mm -hmm. And we ain't done nothing. Yeah. Don't you fool yourself. God know that you were low down and no good. He knew that you was trying to upset the plan, but he still gave them the strength to be able to do it to carry out the mission. See, this is why this is the time for believers to come to church. And I'm going to show you another trick. The devil does a low down on dirt. He's conniving now. He know how to trick folks. And the governor got on TV in the midst of this pandemic, and she issued all these decrees, and you know, we trying to follow them. We wearing masks sanitizing our hand, practicing social distancing. And you know all that's a trick of the, of the enemy because we as a people know how to come together. We've been giving each other five and dapping it up ever since the 70s. But now they done induce fear and say, stay at home, it's safer. Now hear what you do. You still got to go to the grocery store. You still want to go shopping. Although I act like you ain't shopping, you still buying weave, nails, going to the beauty shop, you know, going to buy liquor and cigars. You doing all that stuff. Everybody got some stuff that, that, that they like to do. Right. Yes, sir. Huh? Habits. Yeah, habits that you like to do. But you want God to keep you safe doing that. But on Sunday morning, it's safer for you to stay at home. Look out. And I want to tell you something. You, you, you better watch how you play with God. Because the same God that kept you Monday through Saturday, yes, sir. the same God that let you go up and down the highway to your job, the same God that let you work from home so you can still get a check, is the same God you need to pray. Now, I don't care how you're praising, whether you log in on Facebook, YouTube, the teleconference, 
you, you know, but, but make sure you give him the praise. Because the last time I checked, he said he was a jealous yeah. God. And you know he justified in doing anything that he do that he allowed to happen to you. It's him that put life in your body. Oh, yeah. It's him that breathed in your nostril. And if he want to snatch it back, he justified in doing it. Justified. You ain't got the right to come to a funeral and say, Lord, why you did this? What did you do? Who you prayed for? Who you repented to? I wouldn't let them make a fool out of me. Like every chance I get, I'm in the church. Now was a time I had to stay in the church. That's why David said, I'm glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. There's peace in here. You can get some joy in here. You can get some deliverance in here. You can get it quick. So that you can go back out there and face another day in the church. Every chance you get, you ought to be in the church. Whether it's your church, whether you just bust up and down and say, hey, y'all have a service today. I wouldn't let nobody trick me out of coming to church. And let me give you this testimony. We ain't talking about folks that don't have the means to come to church, but I think about some things that I, that, 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 uh, I've encountered over the past. We had several members. I will call their names. Some of them are deceased now. One member got sick, wanted to come to church, and couldn't come to church for a number of years. And one day she was finally able to come. Somebody brought her. And when she came, she stood right back there at that back door and made her way down to the altar. And the only thing she had to say, she said, I'm so glad that God allowed me to come to church just one more time. And she said, every chance I get, I'm coming. There was a lady that was confined to a wheelchair. And this lady had bags and bags of medicine. But rain, hail, sleet, snow, I ain't exaggerating, nighttime, she was here. Sunday school, here. Bible study, here. If it got late at night, she was here, had a little flash of light on the wheelchair, and one night the police stopped her. And they said, hey, where you going? Somebody go hit you in that wheelchair. She said, shut up your mouth. I'm coming from the church. Serious about serving God. But here we are in the prime of our life. We got health and strength. And we skip out on church like we skip out in high school doing senior ditch day. Let's watch ourselves. Let's not play with God. We owe him the praise. This thing, this corona here, this pandemic is not the time for us to run. Let's wrap this up. It says now here, <clears throat> can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Now, you can't go down there to the Gulf of Mexico. I'm telling you, take it from me. If you're thirsty, you cannot go down to the Gulf of Mexico and say, oh, it's a bunch of water out here. I'm going to just give me a cup of water. You're going to be in for a rude awakening. That's salt water. It ain't fresh. You can't drink it. You know? So then it says here, can a fig tree bear olives and a grapevine bear figs? Then it says, neither can salt and spring produce fresh water. Now, it's interesting that they use the fig tree and the grape because we as spiritual beings are supposed to bear spiritual fruit. You can find it in Galatians. You'll have to take my word. It said the fruit of the spirit is, is nine types of nine, is the number of harvest, 
We're supposed to be producing a spiritual harvest. We're supposed to be producing love, joy, peace, sound mind, long suffering. These are the spiritual fruits that God has mandated and commanded us to produce. Now look here. As we grow and mature, God trims away, he prunes away the stuff that we don't need to have attached to us so that we can produce the fruit that he desires for us to produce. Now, if you ain't producing no fruit, then God got to deal with you. When Jesus got hungry, he went to the fig tree, and it didn't have no fruit on it. It upset him. It upset his nature because he knew what the tree was supposed to do. Are you doing what you're supposed to do? The word of God said Jesus cursed the fig tree. In the vernacular of our language today, he went off on it. Yeah. So you got to make sure you're producing the fruit. As you go along in life, your fruit's supposed to show up. You're supposed to have some love. You're supposed to have some patience. Everything you ain't supposed to make you go out. You're supposed to be able to endure some things. That's all right that they cut you away, so, so what? I know what potted meat tastes like. I know what beyond the sausages tastes like. I know how to survive. I ain't got to have Uncle Ben's rice, China doll. I'm just glad to get some rice. I don't care what the name brand is on it. Y'all quit letting the enemy trick you. 200 years ago, they, they put a brand on you that you didn't even want. Now you paying for the brand. You can't hardly clothe yourself. You gotta have designer labels. And they don't do nothing to support your neighborhood. And I wish one of these designers would run up in here. I uh, put the blood of Jesus on you. You start getting some scholarships to underprivileged kids, making sure some kids go to school, making sure folks got a place to stay and they can eat. Instead of putting millions in your pocket and buying 100 foot yachts, then you can talk to me. Don't you run up in here. Don't you write no comments to this church. If you do, we go deal with you. So we want to thank you now for this word on taming the tongue. And as you grow and mature, whoo, don't be guilty of coming to the church. God just drop me, drop this in my spirit, my pastor. Some people come to the church and they want to tell the pastor how to preach, tell the teacher how to teach, say they can't get nothing out of this to deliver. Let me tell you something. I love you. I don't mean no harm, but I'm going to tell you this. Sit yourself down and learn the word. Follow along with them if you got questions. Ask them the questions so that you can get an understanding of the word. But don't discourage nobody from doing what they've been assigned to do. The moment you say you can't get anything, you give the enemy the permission to take everything that they summon into you. So don't, 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 don't fall into that trap. You may not understand it right then, but years later, days later, someone may say something that activate that word, and it may make total sense to you. Yeah, but we want to encourage you to come out. We want to encourage you to get on the phone. And just like you talk about your favorite TV show, get on the phone and talk about the Word. Get on the phone and ask questions. Call up the pastor the teacher say, hey, I got a question about what you're saying. Yes, sir. Can you help me? Can you show me where I can find it in the scripture? Wow. Yeah, so that we can get this thing together. We're going to close out in prayer. You close out. All right. <clears throat> And, and there's a scripture at the end of our Sunday school lessons. There always is a prayer and a weekly lesson plan, but, but you can pray these scriptures yourself so that God can have a personal, in-depth relationship with us. Now, I want to read the prayer. It says, Dear Lord, please give us the grace to the develop discipline we need to control our words. Huh? So that all we say and do bring on. It say you and uplift others. In Jesus' name we pray. Now so this is what the prayer is. Prayer is nothing more than a conversation. So if we would go put it 
in the activation this morning. This is what we were saying. Heavenly Father, we confess that we've sinned and come short of the glory of God in Jesus' name. Lord, we plead your blood over our tongue. Sometimes, Father, we are upset, we are angry, and we say things that we should not say. God, we really don't mean no harm, but we see that in our, in your eyesight, it's wrong. It caused some others some pain, some discomfort. And instead of blessing them, we might have caused them to have a setback. But God, right now, we want to speak blessings to them, their health, their family, their children, their career. God, our desire is that we make their life better than what it was before we managed. God, give us the discipline. Give us the strength to bring honor to you. And God, we carefully give you the praise. The glory and the honor, in Jesus' name, let the redeemed of God say, Amen. Amen.